Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning the 24th verse. Hear now these words. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fill, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I, will, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I love this story. I think I shared it a few years back. I don't know. I, I, I share stories about every five or six years or four years. Some of them just really good because they make a good point. And this is about this man who had been having problems and he finally decided to go to the doctor because you know us men, we got to wait till we're almost dead before we'll go to a doctor. And this guy finally went in. The doctor ran all these tests and did all these kind of things. And then he called the couple back in a about a week later after all the tests were run. And when he got to the doctor's office, they called the man back to one of the rooms there, the examination rooms, and the doctor came out and invited the wife into his office. And he told the wife, your husband is suffering from a very rare form of anemia. Without treatment, he'll be dead in a few weeks. The good news is it can be treated with the right nutrition. And he went on saying this, he said, you will need to get up early every morning and fix your husband a hot breakfast, pancakes, bacon, and eggs. He'll need a big home-cooked lunch every day and then an old-fashioned meat and potatoes dinner every evening. <laughs> and it would be especially helpful if you could bake frequently cakes, pies, homemade bread. These are the things that will allow your husband to live symptom-free. And just as it seemed like he was finishing, he, he added one more thing. And his immune system is weak, so it's important that you keep the house spotless all the time. Do you have any questions? The wife indicated that she had none, and so the doctor said, do you want to break the news to your husband, or do you want me to? She gave him a solemn look, and she said, I'll break the news to him. So they walked together into the examination room, and as soon as the man saw the look in his wife's eyes, he knew it was serious. And he, he says, it's bad, isn't it? And she says, it's bad. He says, tell me, please, what's, go what's going on? And with tears in her eyes, she blurted out while sobbing, the doctor says, you're going to die. <laughs> See, when it comes to following Christ, to listening to what he calls us to do. Many of us are like that woman. We say, too much work, too much sacrifice. On my part, I can't do that. And so they walk away. But one of the things that we've learned through the ages, that something is, that if something is to really be meaningful, 
we usually have to invest ourselves in it. If we don't have to invest ourselves in anything, then we, later, we, we pretty much start dismissing it. And there are passages where Jesus is pretty blunt about what it means to follow him. I mean, so blunt that we read it and go, man, and we bristle at what he says and what is written. And this passage we read this morning is one of those passages that kind of sounds pretty bad at the beginning. I mean, at first read makes it sound that Jesus said, you know, I've come to split families apart. That doesn't sound like the Jesus we worship. It sounds pretty harsh. And why would you come to split up families? Well, I think to understand that what he's talking about, you have to understand what the Jews taught about this very thought. See, the rabbis for the longest time taught about what would happen on the day of the Lord, the day when the Messiah would come. <clears throat> and they talked about how on that day there would be divisions in families. And the rabbis taught, in the period when the son of David shall come, a daughter will rise up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and so on. And we have to see that it is not the son of David that causes the division. It's the choices in household that cause the division. One says, I stand for God, and another says, you're crazy. And we stand so firm in our beliefs that we, we come against each other. See, the, G's, the Jews need, knew that not everyone was going to say yes to God. And even in our times, we see that not everyone is going to say yes to God, even in the same household. And Jesus pointed this out in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. See, following Christ is a choice. Do we choose to be a disciple of Christ? Or do we follow the world and the wonders of the world? See, this choice is something that God has given us since the very beginning. The Jews saw it. And so when Jesus seems to be making this very harsh statement... What he's really saying in reality is the day of the Lord is here today because I've come to bring about that teaching where people will have to make a decision of yes or no. See, he was laying out that this decision will be made and that we have to figure out who are we going to fear. And this fear isn't like being totally afraid or it's that healthy respect. When you walk before someone who has great authority, do you, do you walk before them with, with a respect? Do we come into the presence of God knowing that he holds life and death over us? And following Christ makes a demand on our lives. In fact, it cost us our very life to follow Christ. Nell Postman once said, Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered as easy and assuming, it is another kind of religion altogether. And we have grown up thinking that Christianity doesn't require much of us. And that's a shame because Christianity requires so much of us. It requires our very life. But thankfully, to start this journey, we don't have to have it all. We don't have to sacrifice everything day one. God just calls us to first make a choice to say yes, and then to seek to follow him. And as we seek to follow him, good things will happen as we surrender our will to him. See, too often we treat our faith like this man wanted to treat his yard. In his book, First Things First, Roger Mills tells of a business consultant who was a very busy man and he hired this wonderful horticulturist, this woman had a doctorate in it, and he got her over and was explaining what he wanted for his landscape around the house, and he kept emphasizing how he wanted it to be low to no maintenance, he wanted everything automated, plants that just didn't need to be tended, and he was going on and on, and finally she stopped him, and she said, you know, there's one thing before we go on that you've got to understand, if there's no gardener, there's no garden." 
Because there's things that have to be done. And that's true with our faith. If we don't work at it, then there will be no faith over time. If we don't work with the disciplines of the Spirit to pray, to read Scripture, to be in fellowship, to worship, to come into God's presence and be still with Him, if we don't do these things, we can't grow in our faith. And what Jesus is trying to do is remind us that we need to grow. And it's kind of radical because it's saying, ignore the word and walk, world and walk with me. And every now and then through history, we see those people that just got it right. And there's a man who lived back in the 1600s. I remember reading his book. And he was just a humble man, simple. He wasn't ed highly educated. He was somewhat educated because he could read and write. And he joined, when he joined the monastery, he became known as Brother Lawrence. Now, you may be thinking you have a hard life. Well, Brother Lawrence kind of endured some bad stuff. It was around 1635, and the Swedes were invading France, and he lived in France, where what was France that time? And they had, the, the Swedes attacked the little town of Rabbers Villas, where he became wounded, leaving him permanently lame. It was interesting that Rammersville had about 2,600 inhabitants at the time of this attack. Eight years later, there were only 400 people left living in this town. As I said, he was left lame. He was, the things he experienced were so horrible that the only thing he could do was fall back on his religious upbringing. And he would, as he joined this Carmelite order, he, he sought to find the presence of God, to know that there must be something more than the horrors he's seen. And what they did is he just wanted to serve, so they put Brother Lawrence to work in the kitchen. Because that's what they do with you as a new monk. They put you to work. And over the years, his leg got so bad because he was injured that he couldn't stand anymore, so they put him to making sandals. But this humble man would speak of God's love. And people from all over the countryside, from royalty down to peasants, would come and want to listen to how to understand God's love. And he would write letters to, to people explaining that. And at the end of his life, all these letters were assembled and put into a wonderful book called The Practice of the Presence of God. I read this book many years ago and I would recommend it to anybody. Even though it was written 400 years ago, what he speaks on experiencing God's love is so true today. And the Abbey Joseph de Beaufort he compiled the work after Brother Lawrence died. He got the approval of Archbishop of Paris, Louis-Antoine de Noëls, was the one who approved it. And this archbishop said this of Brother Lawrence. He said that this brother forgot himself and was willing to lose himself for God, that he no longer thought of virtue or his salvation, that he had always governed himself by love without interest. And this is one of the things that Brother Lawrence would say about a relationship with God, the radical nature of it. He said, let us think often that our only business in this life is to please God. Can you live that way, that the only purpose you have in life is to please God? If you're going to please God, then you're going to be a good father, a good mother. You're going to be a good husband, a good wife. You're going to be a good person, a good worker, because that's one of the ways that we please God. But we seek God's presence. We seek God's will. See, this passage this morning comes from when Jesus was sending out the 12 apostles for the first time, two by two, to go out there and to share and to preach. And he said they needed to understand the purpose of their work. And that has not changed even to today. The work we are called to, it is not our work, but it's God's work. And it requires us to surrender our will to God's will to do it most effectively. And this work will cost us our very life. That's a hard thing to hear. Carlo Corretto once noted that the world and the cross do not get along too well together. 
and comfort and holiness do not share the same room. See, when Jesus told the disciples of all they will find in following him, when they asked him, you know, we've given up everything to follow him. He says, look, you're going to get all these wonderful things. And at the end of this whole list of good things, he goes, oh, and by the way, you're going to suffer. We don't like to hear that. But to live in this world and to follow Christ means we will suffer. But we will not suffer without peace, without joy. Because we'll find that the suffering reduces over time and the joy and the peace increase. And what Christ is ultimately trying to tell us is that the change must happen in us. And that change is not always easy and sometimes it hurts. But in changing, we become new creations. In losing life to this world, we find eternal life. But this grace that God offers us is costly. It cost God the life of his only son and it cost us our life. In the book, The Cost of Discipleship by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he writes about this struggle and he sums it up in a discussion of cheap grace versus costly grace. He describes cheap grace as the deadly enemy of the church and that we who call ourselves follower of Christ are following, are fighting today for costly grace. And this is how he described cheap grace. Just a short snippet. He describes cheap grace as a doctrine, a principle, and a system. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. He argued kind of if grace does not change us, then it is cheap. And he says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living in incarnate. And that's what we have to fight against. And he said, this is what costly grace is. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which we must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. But it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life or a woman his life. And it is grace because it gives a man and a woman the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinner. And above all, it is costly because it costs the Son of God, the life of his, it costs the God, the life of his Son. He says, ye were born, you bought at a price. And what costs God much cannot be cheap for us. But above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his Son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. See, Jesus asked to radically follow him in these ways of surrendering our will to him and living his way so that we can find the best life available. And I think we can spend a lifetime fighting that change in us. We know that change is not instantaneous. It takes a whole lifetime, I think, of coming to surrender our will to God. But this is how we find the true life, the true peace. It begins with our surrendering our will to God and learning to trust God's will. And it ends in eternal life where there will no longer be struggles, tears, or suffering. But it is radical because it goes against everything the world tells you to do. Live for Christ and find life. Let us pray. Oh, well, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. Most especially, Lord, we thank you that you are frank with us at times. And you speak words of life. That you show us the truth, even when it hurts. Because you want us to be restored. You want us to be healed. You want us to find life eternal life. And Lord, we can only do this with your Holy Spirit. So, so help us to sense that Holy Spirit that you have given us. 
Give us that power so that we might die to self and live to you. That we might love as you have loved. And find the life you offer to us. And help us to be that kind of person, follower of Christ. Help us to be collectively that kind of church. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen. Amen.